You're listening to Shift, Human First Financial Guidance with Ross Marino. Today, we are shifting the conversation with Nancy Blakey. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Ross. Thanks for being on the show today. How about you take the first 30 seconds and tell everybody who you are and what you do? All right. I'm Nancy Blakey. I'm a sales growth consultant who helps advisors and advisory teams figure out how to work with more clients and get more comfortable with their selling. Selling's a big issue for me, uh, and I'll tell you why quickly. Early in my career, uh, it, it's something I was uh, pretty good at. It was the smile and dial years, and I would dial that phone 500 times a day uh, back when we did that kind of stuff, and I would get enough people to talk to me. But by my mid-20s, I hit that point where I thought, I I don't want to learn anything about sales. I need to be technically proficient. And then all of a sudden, I became excessive where I didn't want to read anything related to relationships or sales or any of that stuff. I just wanted to hone my craft and get so much better. There was something in me that said, I I, I don't want to do this part. Is that that normal? Is it common? Where does that come from? I think it's interesting that at first you did it and then you determined you didn't want to do it. You know, for most people, they never want to do it from the beginning. Um, And that was that was me too. any kind of interview after college that was about sales. I was like, not for me. Um, But here's why it's early life experiences and the messaging that we get from early on. No parents encourage their kids to go into selling or get a sales job, right? Unless they've been a professional salesperson who's done very well. Otherwise, no one's encouraged in it. And until the last six, seven years, there was no degree or you know emphasis in colleges for it either. So it's been portrayed in movies and TV as this yucky, shyster, don't trust that person. And even now, when people say to me, Oh, that's right. You work with salespeople. Like, I, it's like it's a dig. Like, it's not a like a positive compliment. So, I think that that's that that's what happens. Is we've been we've been programmed to think of it so negatively. So, you help advisors equip themselves with you say right the, the right skills and the right mindset, and mm-hmm. it, that resonated with me when I read it. I thought, oh, that's something I definitely need to understand because I went so extreme many years ago. So why don't we start with that? As an advisor, what, what's my mindset as I approach client interactions and sales? You know, I think one of the big things is that I, I, I've talked with many advisors and, and they are, the mindset is that it's not a negative, right? I'm not doing something bad to somebody by selling. And that uh, my mindset is that this is the first value I get to give somebody is by helping them make that decision to get help to work with me and to, you know, to whatever that my problem is, you know, get the help with that problem opportunity one or need, but that if we can get over the mindset that sales is manipulation, deception, et cetera, and instead think about it is this is real service that we're doing because selling is an information exchange. It's, it's an opportunity to be a guide to help someone else focus on the information that's important for them and for for me to understand them so that they can confidently make a decision or commit to an action. So if we can think about selling in that way, it changes the game of our our mindset that we can't help them with our great technical skills like you know that you spent years honing unless we can help them with the first part. And I would also very strongly argue that advisors are constantly selling because every conversation you have, every uh meeting that you have with your clients you're almost always helping them commit to a change or to take an action in something. And that is, again, an information exchange where we're selling to help them make a decision or a commitment to action. So it's not just the first sale is getting them to work with us, but we're constantly helping them move along in their change by selling. I'd imagine the final decision, if you look at a list of decisions is, okay, I want to work with this person or someone wants to hire me. But I I know you zero in on a few major decisions that someone has to make before, I guess, or when they get to that point of, okay, I want to work with Ross. I trust him. I believe in him. I want to work with him. Could you touch on those decisions that lead up to that? Well, the decisions are, first of all, you know, 
Am I open to help? Right? That's what gets them into the conversation. Am I open to this? Then it's, okay, am I willing and committed to getting help? Or it, maybe it's not help that there's something bad, but there's just, they're looking, they're looking for a service. Then it's, are you the right person? And am I willing to pay for it? Right. And, and, and to get started. So there is a series of decisions that all need to help happen before you can really help them with their finances. So are there, are, are there lead in conversations for every one of those questions that are distinctly different? Or is this part of a process that you just go step one, two, three, four? I think it's part of a process and the pro process can be different. People have different sales processes. You know, I have one meeting, I do everything and off we go. No, I have a two meeting. We do this in the first meeting and that meeting. And then that's when I ask them the decision. So it fits into all the processes, but the information exchange is what's necessary, right? I have to constantly earn the right to help guide them to what's next. And that is it, that is guiding this information exchange. And first, I need to learn from them what's going on, what is it that they want, and you know some other factors on the impact of that to and qualify them. Not only to qualify like, hey, can they afford me, blah, 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 but are they going to be someone good for me to work with? Do, do the set of situation they have, can my expertise be of value to them? And so, you know, it's leading that, intake of information and through that by understanding them and their story that's when i earn the right for them to care about the information i want to share with them that either is educating them or is at minimum connecting value to what i would do in helping them so that i can then move forward to helping them make that 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 first big decision of yes we want to work with you so one of the areas I find challenging is when we meet a prospect for the first time that, uh, you know, let's have a cup of coffee or, or let's get to know each other. And generally when people would approach a financial planner, there's a pain point, there's a problem, there's some big decision that they're facing. But when they approach us, they, they tend to ask a question or questions that are, here's what I need to know. I want to know how to do this. They're, they're the what and how type questions. And those are, those are questions that information is the answer that they want. Now, I know that I have to address those questions. Uh, eventually, I want to shift the conversation into what really matters. But is there a fine line between addressing those questions that ask for information and me just monologuing and dumping on them and practically putting them to sleep? How do I find that fine line? You know, it's interesting. You got to, I always say, step back from the situation that seems challenging and what's really going on there, right? So if someone's willing to talk to you, they're looking for a couple of things. They're looking for validation for themselves in some way. They're looking for confirmation that there is somebody that could help them. And they're looking for hope, right? So they're looking for information. The other thing is when they come into that conversation, most people don't know how to buy what you offer. Right. So they come into it with how, how do they normally buy things? I've got to do, I've got to do research. I've got to look for specs. I've got to look for reviews. They don't know how to, to, you know, the information they should be looking for to determine, can I trust you? Can you help me with the set? Maybe not just today, but in an, an ongoing way. So they come into it with some barriers up. And one of the ways to keep yourself safe is to put the focus on you. So I always say when they give you those questions, it's a trap. And I don't think it's a conscious trap, but it's a trap where they're, they're doing a test of who are you about? Who do you care about? Because if you start going off about you and what you can do and all of that, you've now taken the focus off them. Now I get to just sit back and like watch as judge and jury. Do I believe him? Is this on the right track, et cetera? And so, so what, what we can do at that time when the conversation early goes there. Remember, we want to earn the right to ask them questions. So they want to really hear what we have to say. And like you said, the monologue, like, you know, they check out of that, um, is that we need to validate, you know, I understand those are important questions to you. And then we could say something like, and it would be a disservice for me to answer something that specific without understanding the context of your situation. And that's not how I work with people. And so um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to understand more about you and your, your full situation. And then I'll be able to let you know, can I help you with this? 
Is this something that's a quick answer or is this something that we would need to look at how we would work together on it? It's a great way to shift the conversation and and what just popped into my head because that's what happens when I ask questions and I'm, I'm listening to people is that, that situation where someone says, here's what I'm doing and, and my brain is practically screaming that that is absolutely not in your best interest. And I, I'm dying to answer them, Nancy. I want to answer them and say, you are doing A, but you really should do B. And I understand that you don't want people to to not feel smart or feel like they made mistakes, but the value that I can bring, because now the numbers are in my head. If you'd have been yeah. doing B instead of A, <laughs> let me tell you, you should have met me 10 years ago because I'm the guy, not that person you're working with. And th that's hard. You get excited. You see it. Uh, how, how do I dance around that when it seems blatantly obvious that, yes, this is something I could just touch on, but then I'll shift the conversation. Should I go there or j just uh, don't do that right up front? So I think this is where people need to be genuine, right? And if you are really passionate about something and you're holding that in and you have other nervous energy, they don't know how to take it. I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, you know what? I have some strong opinions on that and it's premature for me to tell you, or um, I have some strong opinions on that, but I want to make sure that I'm not biased in some way. And so let's talk further, you know, to get there. But I think you can also give them hope and say, absolutely, that is something that we will work on if you choose to work with me. It will be one of our first priorities because I can see that this is so important to you. So we can get it out there and let them know, gosh, I'm so passionate about this. And this actually happened to me recently with an advisor. I go, I actually found myself going, I go, oh my gosh, we need to work together. Like, it's just like, oh my gosh. And we were probably, you know, 25% into really me understanding, but it was so obvious. His confidence was so low and he was, you know, hitting like a 13% conversion rate. And I was just like, oh my gosh, let's shortcut the rhythm. Let's go. So anyway, I understand what you mean, but you know, so I think within the right situation, we can bring some of that in because if that's what we're really, but then we got to reel it back in and refocus back to them. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's finding that balance between giving them hope without making them feel like they did something poor. You know, it's the looking forward to the next steps as opposed to looking back and saying, ah, you know, that, that didn't really work out. And in some cases, their decisions may have been absolutely the most appropriate decision at the time. Just It just didn't work out anyway. And uh, I know up front, that's, that's hard, I think, to explain to people that just because it didn't work out doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. I'm not sure people really want to hear that up front. True. True. But they are talking to you for a reason. There's something that they're they're hoping for. So, um, but I agree, we can't make them, you don't want them to feel bad. But I know another thing I'll talk to people about is when they come in, like those are their pressure points, right? There's pressure been built and that's what's, that's what's top of mind for them. And sometimes if we do give them the answer and like shh, take down the pressure, they're now not urgently looking for help. And it can stall you really being able to start that work with them. So, you know, we, we really have to be careful in those situations. You mentioned confidence a few minutes ago, and, and I, I remember reading some some uh, text on your website and it was talking about confidence. And what popped into my head was, is how how much does confidence move the needle? I mean, I know we have to have you know, we often look at some advisors and say, oh, they got swagger, but, you know, big hat, no cattle, right? They actually um, don't think they know what they're talking about, but, you know, they got the big hat and uh, they get business. And and you know that a lot of it's related to confidence. Um, I know information and technical proficiency can't really overcome that or not do a good job with it. So, you know, if I'm low on the confidence scale, what are some things I could do to maybe beef myself up or feel a little bit better about myself? Oh my gosh. One of the things that frustrates me so much is the advisors that I've worked with that had all the technical knowledge and whatever, but because of their confidence, they weren't working with enough people to share that with. And then I see some people that I'm like, ah, I don't know if I would trust them to have, you know, been able to help in the way, whatever, but they were confident. So if someone is not, that's a very different question. If someone is not confident, what can you do? There's a couple of easy things. Um, they're, they're easy, but they're hard, right, to execute because it is about self-belief. And so I say, if your confidence is low, one of the first things you should do is to 
sit down and make note of the people that you've helped in the past, Mm. right? And note, what is it that they thank you for? Like, what are the things they thank you for? Nowadays, with all the years of emails, go through your emails. What have people said to you? Have they sent you specific notes to thank you? And I always suggest people have something called a smile file. And I use bright yellow files that I give to advisors. And that's where you need to put the things that build your confidence. And it's been found, you know, you talked about the brain at shifts. There were so many, you know, images of brains. But that when we, when someone verbally tells us something, like we can take that in. When we're reading it on a screen, whether it's a computer screen or our phone, you know, we, we take it in. But when we can touch something, it actually is, you know, um, embedded further in our brain. So I always tell people, when people send you emails, print them, touch them, read them, and then have the smile file that, you know, allows you to do that. And another way to build confidence for selling situations is to be prepared for the conversation, not the presentation. And there's a difference. We can prepare for what we want to say, but we need to prepare for how are we guiding an entire conversation? How are we starting it to get on the same page? What are the questions that are going to anchor the information exchange to get their story surfaced? What are then the you know potential talking points that I might use? What am I going to do to make sure there's any concerns or objections and get those surfaced? And one of the least prepared for parts of conversations is, How am I going to guide that last part to ask for that decision or commitment? So it's a process. And if we can outline the whole conversation, people's confidence goes up significantly when they walk into it. Because I believe an advisor's confidence ignites the prospective client's confidence or not. (laughs) One way or the other totally makes sense. Well, this has been fantastic. I, I know of your training. I know it's extensive. This is a, a great insight into what you can do. Uh, we'll put that information up when we uh, publish this podcast and YouTube video. Appreciate you being on the show. Nancy Blakey, thanks for being part of us today. All right. Thanks, Ross. Thank you for listening to Shift with Ross Marino. Please visit humanfirst.live to learn more. This show is for general information purposes only and is not intended to provide recommendations or advice. Speak with a legal, tax, or financial advisor before making any decisions. Past performance references are historical and do not guarantee future results. 